each other and just learn about each other's lives, just how uh, we can apply what God tells us in the Bible. Um, I learn a lot about my uh, family in Christ that, that way. Some stuff I didn't know, some stuff I didn't want to know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but it's been a blessing. So I encourage you, um, like I said, there's, all, there's Sunday school classes for all ages, and they're all great. Um, so um, I know it's a little bit er, er, earlier than, than service, but I would definitely encourage you. Uh, I know you won't be disappointed. So on Sunday, January 24th, we will be holding our annual business meeting following the morning service. The 2020 business meeting minutes and the proposed budget for, the, for 2021 are available at the Welcome Center. This year, we approached several men to prayerfully consider coming on the 2021 board. However, each man and his family felt that God was not calling them to serve on the board for this year. Therefore, we do not have any board candidates this year to vote on, so we will only be voting on the approval of last year's minutes and the proposed 2021 budget. There will be a budget Q&A meeting next Sunday in room 201 after the morning service. And next, I am very pleased to introduce someone, uh, many of you know her. Uh, she's going to share about her, her ministry with Child Evangelism Fellowship, AKA CEF, Miss Mary Beth Pulowski. Good morning. I'm so glad to be here. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for allowing me to come today. And as Jake said, I um, am now a local missionary for Child Evangelism Fellowship. I am the Lake County Ministry Coordinator, and I was hired about eight months ago to do that job. Um, uh, some of you, though, know that I've had a long history here at SBC, and um, for those of you who don't know, about 20 years ago, I walked through these doors not knowing a whole lot of truth about God. And here I received my first Bible and began to grow so much um, through the Sunday sermons and ladies' Bible studies, ABF um, classes, uh, personal discipleship and sweet fellowship with um, brothers and sisters in Christ, I grew. And um, to stand before you today wanting to affirm the amazing impact um, the body of believers at SBC has had on my life. And I'm so grateful to you. Um, I also am grateful and stand in awe of the way God has worked in my life and continues to work in my life. To him be the glory. Um, I also want to thank the mission committee and you for the support um, that you've given me of my, my new endeavor here with the Lord. I appreciate your prayers and your financial giving. Um, I'm going to show another slide. Yes, tell you about um, Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, began in 1937, and it is now the largest children's ministry in the world. The mission of CEF is to evangelize boys and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ, disciple them, and to um, connect them with a local church. CEF operates um, on the local, national, and worldwide level, having a presence in almost every nation. The two primary ways CEF reaches children are through Good News Clubs and Backyard Bible Clubs, um, or excuse me, five-day clubs. They used to be called Backyard Bible Clubs. Um, Good News Clubs are taught by CEF um, workers and trained volunteers. Some of you may be familiar with the Good News Club that Lois Kaiser helps in. Well, until the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, Good News Clubs were mainly held in elementary schools um, after school by renting out space. This provided um, a great way to reach children. CEF simply went where there was a lot of kids already. And a Supreme Court ruling in 2001 allowed CEF not to be discriminated against in their using uh, public facilities. So our hope is to get back into the public schools um, in the future, but God in his faithfulness has provided ways for us to still reach children with online clubs. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about the online clubs. We meet with the kids um, every week um, where we get to present the gospel, um, teach a Bible lesson, disciple the children and pray with them. With so many closures and the ways people typically connect um, being shut down because of COVID, uh, we are so grateful to be um, able to reach children and their families this way. And, it, and we're feeling a real need, it seems. Um, I'd like to share just a couple uh, stories just from the last couple weeks of club. Um, 
So as teachers, we open our Zoom club about an hour before we actually start with kids. And we have kids wanting to get admitted like quarter to four and, and just early because they can't wait to get on. And last week, um, the first girl we admitted, um, we said hi to, and she, she gave us a quick hi. And then she says, can angels sin? She's like, I want to know, but my mom said to ask you guys. And so um, it's wonderful that kids are coming, like wanting to know things and, and having um, the ability to talk with an adult and pray with us. Um, and even just two weeks ago, I was texting parents to remind uh, a reminder, and a mom texted back right away and asked for a prayer for her husband and herself. And so um, these connections that are happening are wonderful. Um, one of the highlights of my Christmas season was we... Um, uh, arrange visits to all the kids' homes to drop off Christmas uh, treat bags. And uh, we were welcome at every home. And some of them, you know, we stood on the porches and, and had a quick visit, but the kids were so excited to see um, their teachers visit them. So again, I'm super thankful um, to be still out there doing, you know, the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, our five-day clubs uh, meet in the summer months, and they run for um, typically a week, and they're held in um, the home, the backyard of a host. And um, these clubs are taught by youth. Uh, CEF has an, um, a branch out called um, Christian Youth in Action, where um, youth 12 years old or older are able to become summer missionaries and are um, trained by CEF to... Um, present this club to neighborhood kids. And so I got to watch some of the training and participate in it um, in the summer. And I was so impressed at the um, level of excellence these children are held to, these youth um, in their training. And they seem extremely equipped to um, present the Bible lesson and a verse and um, share the gospel effectively. Well, there's so much more about CEF I would love to tell you, but I want to be respectful of the time I've been given. Um, so just to move on, I'd like to share reasons that I hope will compel you, if you're not there already, um, to understand the importance of why we need to evangelize and disciple children. Um, the first and foremost reason um, is because it's important to God. Um, Jesus showed through the way he received children that they matter to him. They have value now. Not at the young age they're at, they're people, real people, right now. Um, on the slide behind me, yeah, you'll see um, what I'm going to call some staggering facts. Uh, one study found as many as 85% of all Christians say they prayed to receive Jesus as their Savior um, before the age of 15. Yet 90% of missionary efforts today focus on adults. This 4 to 14 window is the largest unreached people group on the planet, with one-third of our population being children. In the book of Matthew, we read Jesus himself telling the adults to let the little children come to me. Child Evangelism Fellowship is doing just that, and your support is making that happen. So thank you. Um, if you want to talk with me more about CF and ways you can get involved, I'll be available after service, or I think on the like e-bulletin, my contact information might be there. Um, on the uh, table in the foyer are some um, flyers, some pamphlets about CEF and my contact information. So, um, and I'm not just talking to adults, if there's kids that are youth that are 12 years old and older and want to participate um, as a summer missionary, um, contact me as well. So thank you guys so much for letting me share. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Isn't it great to see the Lord just continuing to work in those who have blessed our congregation over the years? And, and uh, we hope to continue to, to bless her and the Pulowskis as they, as they move forward and what the Lord has for them to do. Um, so I ask you right now to stand as we begin our time of worship, and please let me open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just want to say that we love you, Lord. We, we thank you for our time together, that you can um, just encourage us, Lord, with the things that you're continuing to do in the world. We know that you don't stop working, Lord. Um, no virus is going to stop you from reaching people, Lord, and, and we thank you for that. We know that you are mighty, that you are righteous and holy. Lord, we, uh, we desire this morning to just lift you up humbly, to praise your name. Lord, we ask that during this time that, that, that you would be glorified, that we would be edified, Lord, and that your word would, would penetrate our hearts deeply, Lord, that we can ultimately become more and more like you each day. 
So Lord, we want to say that we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Sing that one more time. He is holy, isn't he? Amen.
Amen, amen. We're not clapping for any of us here. We're praising God, right? He gets all the glory, and it is okay to worship Him and express yourself in that worship, and we just want to rejoice in that.
Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord. We want to praise you this morning and this afternoon. We ask right now, Lord, as, you, as we enter in the time of hearing your word, Lord, uh, that it would penetrate our hearts, that, that we would see you anew and afresh, Lord, in a way that would impact us so that we desire how much even in a greater way that we can walk with you. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. doing this morning? You sure about that? Doesn't sound convincing. Man, oh man. <laughs> well, as the uh, kiddos are heading out, why don't we uh, pray once again. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for you. We are thankful for the privilege and the honor that it is to be your church, to worship you, to have the ability, the, the, again, the privilege to come together in your name. God, we pray right now that um, during this time, especially uh, with the things that are going on in the world, when the things that are going on in our nation, God, that we would, as your church, unify around you. And that as your church, we would, we would be a beacon of, of hope and light and love to the world. That they could look to us and see uh, your love for them in the midst of everything else that's going on. If there's nothing else that they can know through how well we love them, that you love them as well. Give us boldness in that. Um, give us a desire to spread that love through the message of your gospel. God, because... All the problems in this world right now, because so many people don't know you. God, help us to be salt and light for you in this world. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Again, good morning. I know it's been a uh, difficult and maybe discouraging week for many. Um, not just because what's going on in the country with the elections, uh, it's just, just becoming increasingly difficult to live as a Christian in this world. It's become increasingly difficult to uh, keep our eyes and our focus on where it needs to be and not being bogged down by all the stuff that's going on, which is why, again, as I prayed, I'm so thankful I'm so encouraged by the gift that God has given us in the church. The ability to come together around our unifying identity in Christ. To be able to support and encourage and strengthen and love each other. This is a blessing and so often we don't take the time to acknowledge or to understand just what it is God has gifted us in the church. One of the greatest blessings in Christian life is the church because at times like these, this is when we need to be reminded of the hope that we have, the hope that we need to cling to no matter what. That's Christ. And see, this morning we're going to be starting up again in our verse-by-verse series through the book of Philippians. And so, if you haven't already, why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. And while we're doing that, let's spend just a few moments again uh, reminding ourselves, reorienting ourselves to the text that we're going through. And so, if you remember from last year, <laughs> that joke isn't quite old yet, but if you remember from last time that we were in Philippians, Paul uh, pointed us to two examples he pointed to Timothy and Epaphroditus, and these two men were given to us as examples of what it looks like for the quote-unquote average Christian, average person to live 
a Christian life. What it looks like to imitate Christ in daily, everyday life, to value others more than yourselves, to love and to serve sacrificially. Because again, we're to shine like stars in this world. And this is only possible when we love God and love each other. And so now in our passage this morning, Paul is going to be pointing us back to one of the themes, um, one of the purposes of this letter, the theme that we've, we based this sermon series around. Because remember, Paul is writing a letter of encouragement. He's writing a letter of encouragement to a church experiencing difficult circumstances, persecution from without, the beginnings of divisions from within. And he's writing this letter from prison where he's in chains for preaching the gospel. And yet the reason why Paul is writing this letter is to encourage us to find joy, even as he himself has joy despite his circumstances. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, he says this, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So too, should you be glad and rejoice with me. And the reason why Paul can rejoice, the reason why he can encourage the Philippian church is because of Christ. Because he knows Jesus and has relationship with him. Paul's joy, as we're going to see this morning, is in knowing Christ. It's not about what's going on in his life. It's not about what's going on in the world. It's not about his circumstances, his past, his ancestry, his religious piety. His focus is on eternity. The resurrection and new life that are promised in Christ. And because of this focus, he truly can find joy in all circumstances. Which is why he starts our passage here this morning, the way that he does. In verses 1 through 3, his encouragement is that we rejoice in Christ because of what being a follower of Christ means for us. It says this, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So we see that this section begins again with a, a repeat, a reiteration of one of the main themes of the letter. Rejoice in the Lord. This is a present tense imperative. It's a command, meaning that regardless of circumstances, regardless of hardships, regardless of the activity of the enemy, we are to rejoice. Specifically, rejoice in the Lord. I mean, think about it for a second. Who remembers? Where, where is Paul when he's writing this letter? He's in prison. He's literally in chains for the gospel. And he says it is no trouble for him to write this. Think about that. See, what Paul's teaching us, he's reminding us here, is that joy for a Christian, it isn't an option. It isn't something that's only for special occasions. It's not reserved for when things are going good. No, if you are a believer, if you've been saved, then you are always in the Lord and you should therefore always rejoice in that, in that location, that, that positional righteousness, the salvation and new life that you have in Christ. And Paul's going to expand on this in a little bit, but, but friends, we have to understand that as Christians, joy is important and it needs to be a significant part of our life, of our fellowship, of our community. We need joy. We have to always seek 
to rejoice in the Lord. Because as Paul also tells us here in verse 1, this is a safeguard as well. It's a protection, locating our joy in our relationship with Christ. This shields us from having to try to force joy out of the world, out of our circumstances. When our joy is in the Lord, not in what's going on. This allows us then to realistically look at and assess the world without losing hope. Because the hope that brings us joy is perfect, reliable, trustworthy, true, and will never, ever fail us. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We're to rejoice in the Lord, to protect us, to safeguard us from being bogged down by the circumstances of life. But we have to understand this correctly because if we're honest, then there is also within us, as, as Paul goes on to point out in verse 2, there's this ever-present danger, maybe a, a temptation sometimes, to try to tie our position in Christ to ourselves, to our external righteousness, to our ability to follow the rules which is why in verse 2 he goes on to warn us against those who teach such things. Because if we seek joy in external circumstances, even if it is our ability to follow the rules and regulations, we still abandon the source of true joy. And we replaced him with a poor substitute. See, from the context here, Paul is, is talking about specifically the practice of circumcision. And Scripture actually gives us a hint of what's going on behind the scenes here. So apparently, in the church at this time, there was a group of Jewish Christians who taught that Christianity, that the faith, by necessity, must include circumcision as part of the faith. And this teaching had led to all kinds of problems in the church throughout the Roman Empire. And it eventually resulted in a religious council being convened in Jerusalem, which is described in Acts chapter 15. And at that council, the, the apostles and other church leaders, they concluded that circumcision, as well as ritual observance of the law, it wasn't required for Christian faith. And we see in Paul's life as well that he was one of the strongest opponents to what was called the circumcision party. Even here it shows in his progressively harsher terms that he uses for people who teach this. Dogs evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. And his harsh judgment in this manner, it stems from Paul's hatred of legalism in general. And the essence of legalism is making personal convictions or beliefs, things that are a matter of conscience, into a matter of required and correct belief and practice. See, nothing is inherently wrong with circumc circumcision in and of itself. But Paul has harsh words for those who teach that it is required for Christian faith, that it's necessary to be faithful or even to be saved. One example, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul has an argument that goes like this. In Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And then in verses 4 through 6, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then down in verses 11 and 12, brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. See, Paul is talking about circumcision here. 
But the warning isn't just about circumcision. It's about trying to either condemn or require any practice that's not clearly commanded or condemned, at least in principle in Scripture. Trying to seek righteousness, justification, through following the right rules, doing the right things, not doing the wrong things. In their time, it was circumcision and obeying some of the the ritualistic Old Testament laws. The American church in history, it has been many different things. Going to movies. Having drums in church. What kind of clothes you wear on Sunday morning. Today, it could be those same issues. It could be other matters that someone might have a personal conviction about. And don't get me wrong, it's not sinful to have convictions on issues and practices. It's not wrong to be convicted on things that are truly a matter of conscience, things that we don't have a clear or applicable, applicable command in principle or in practice. But when it's wrong is when we take those things and we make them necessary for faithfulness, for Christian faith and practice. And we can't do these things lest we fall into the circumcision party and stand equally condemned. Things like this, Paul says in this in Romans 14, 5 and 6. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. We have to be aware of legalism because when it comes down to it, our salvation isn't based on the rules we follow. It's not based on the purity of our observance of rituals, how well we've isolated ourselves From the culture, salvation is based in Christ and his gracious love. And yes, we seek to obey the commands of God, the commands of Christ, but we can't seek justification through the law. We receive that by grace, the grace of forgiveness in Christ. Which is why here in verse 3, Paul refers to the Philippians, he refers to the church as a whole as the circumcision. Not the physical act, but the the spiritual circumcision. What circumcision was meant to symbolize. The change of heart. The sanctifying work of God. It engenders true spiritual growth and maturity. Even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10, 16, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be a stiff-necked any longer. Then Galatians Back in Galatians 6, 15 and 16, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. See, Paul understood that spiritual worship, worship of the heart, love, these things have always been more important to God than the physical acts associated with worship. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, he says this. I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Our confidence in salvation, our assurance that what God has started, he will faithfully complete. This isn't based on external acts of righteousness, on how well we conform to the law. Let me tell you from my own life, praise God that that's true. This is grace. This is is why we rejoice in all circumstances. Why Paul can say that it's no trouble for him to tell us this. 
even in prison, because our salvation is by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. Boast in Christ. Put your confidence in Christ, not in your flesh. See, Paul is so concerned that we get this correct that he uses the next three verses to point to himself, to his former way of living, to the confidence that he used to have in the flesh as an example of how we're not to think. In Paul's understanding, if anyone had a reason to boast or rely or have confidence in the flesh for right standing before God, it would have been him. As he says in verses 4 through 6, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. See, from a human, and especially a Jewish perspective, Paul had every reason to be confident in the flesh, to be confident in having the proper credentials to be right with God. And he lists some of these qualifications in two categories, hereditary and achievement, because these are the same two categories that everybody, even us today, we still tend to focus on in our own pursuit of righteousness apart from faith. So first, Paul offers four hereditary, four natural reasons of nature and of birth of why he would place his confidence in the flesh. First, he was an eight-day man, meaning that he was circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with a strict observance of Old Testament law. From the very beginning, from the point of his birth onward, he was visibly a part of the covenant. Because secondly, he was an Israelite. He was one of God's chosen people, part of the covenant, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the group that, in his former way of thinking, God loved most. And third, he says he was a Benjaminite. He could trace his ancestry to Benjamin, one of the sons of Jacob's favored wife. And his tribe, that tribe, Benjamin, held special significance because it was the tribe that produced Israel's first king. But finally, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. A summary statement of all of his qualifications, as well referring to even his ability to speak Hebrew and read Hebrew, unlike many of his contemporaries. Even in Israel, who only spoke and read Aramaic and maybe Greek. His life, everything about him proved that he wasn't a a Hellenized Jew. He wasn't influenced by Greek culture. He hadn't become a Gentile, but he was a good and faithful Jewish man. As far as ancestry and natural qualifications, Paul had it covered. But even more, he could point to his own life. He could point to his achievements as further reason for his confidence, his former confidence in the flesh. Three achievements. First, he was a Pharisee. Being a Pharisee, this showed his love and concern for the law. Men he chose to be a part of the Jewish sect that was most concerned with proper interpretation and application of the law. He loved God and he wanted to serve him by teaching his people how best to follow God's commands. Second, Paul points to, oddly enough, maybe from our perspective, He points to his persecution of the church as a qualification because it showed that he was zealous for God. Paul's concern for the law was such that before his conversion, he went and he persecuted the church. He had zeal, commitment to God, to the nation of Israel. He tried to snuff out this upstart sect, at least from his Misinformed understanding. And then finally, he refers to himself as blameless. 
blameless regarding a law-based righteousness. Again, this is a summary statement. Paul was pointing to his publicly blameless way of life in the eyes of the law. He's saying that no one could bring a charge against him as far as correct observance of these public statutes. In this, he sounds much like the rich young ruler who had spoken to Jesus and thought himself to be righteous before the, law, the eyes of the law as well. In Matthew 19, 18 through 20. Which ones, he inquired. And Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? In worldly terms, Paul had everything going for him. He had no reason, no human reason, to abandon his confidence in the flesh. From our perspective, he was maybe a Rockefeller, descended from one of those who came over on the Mayflower, a son of the Revolutionary War, independently wealthy, with earned doctorates in medicine and law and astrophysics maybe, successful in his career in academia. Yet as he goes on to say, he became like a man who had given all that up to go work in a soup kitchen while sleeping in the basement of the YMCA and then was arrested for giving free meals to hungry people. Something that he gladly did because he came to understand that the only confidence he could possibly have and rely on throughout his life is based on his relationship with Christ, not matters of his flesh. Look what he goes on to say in verses 7 through 11. But whatever regains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Everything about Paul's former life, everything he just pointed to, everything that he had placed his hope in, the right ancestry, being one of the honored members of God's chosen people, being zealous, a Pharisee who was blameless and upright before God, at least in his former understanding, who had dedicated his life to protecting God's people by persecuting that upstart cult called the way. Look at how he describes it now. Now that he knows Jesus. Loss, loss, garbage, literally, dung. It's not that they were intrinsically wrong, but that they were worthless re with regard to tr true righteousness. Paul willingly, eagerly cast all these things aside, Everything that he had used to measure his value and his worth and standing before God and rightness in the community, he exchanged them all for Christ. For knowing, having a true and saving relationship with Christ Jesus, his Lord. Your Lord. My Lord. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more precious, more worthy, more joyous 
of more infinite worth than knowing Christ Jesus as your Lord. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. When it gets down to it, Paul understands Christ is gain, not loss. Knowing him, serving him, loving him, worshiping, receiving his salvation, this is of infinite gain, infinite worth. There's no comparison between Christ and the things of this world. So Paul gladly gave them up. He gladly released his hold on the things that had brought him value and significance and worth in order to serve and follow he who is infinitely valuable and infinitely significant and infinitely worthy. In coming to Christ, Paul realized that true righteousness wasn't possible by himself. That what he had considered righteousness in the law before was not true righteousness. The only righteousness that is possible, the only right standing that we can have before God that allows us to be welcomed and accepted in his presence is the righteousness of Christ. Imputed, credited to us through faith in him. The sacrifice that he willingly gave on the cross. Again in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just, the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Paul understood this. He internalized it. He lived it in his life. And in light of this vast and profound truth, Paul wanted something more. He wanted something better than the righteousness he had sought after before. The righteousness that he now considered as filth. He wanted to be found in Christ and to have his righteousness be the righteousness of knowing him. The righteousness that comes not through personal merit, work or achievement, but through faith in Christ's merit, Christ's work, Christ's achievement. The righteousness that depends on God's grace received in faith. Not because faith saves you, but because faith is surrendering a personal effort. It's giving up trying to save yourself and entrusting yourself completely to the one who can and will save you by his grace. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The defining desire of Paul's life was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. To know Christ in a deep, life-shaping, life-determining and altering way. He wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the resurrection and new life that are offered and available in Christ. He wants to know Christ. And in this, Paul understands that knowledge of Christ, knowing him in this way, it's not informational, it's relational. You see, before coming to Christ, Paul already knew a lot about God. 
in an informational sense. He was an expert in the law, an expert in the Torah, the Old Testament. Paul knew more information about God and his works and understanding those things than I will probably ever know in my life. But after being introduced to Christ in a powerful, undeniable way in his case, Paul understands and his understanding of knowledge and relationship with God fundamentally changed. Information about God is important, yes, but knowledge is only important in as much as it allows us to draw closer to him in relationship. In Christ, Paul shifted from knowledge in and of itself to relationship based on knowing. And since so much of Christ, of salvation, has to do with his suffering on our behalf, Paul embraces this, saying that he wanted to share in Christ's sufferings. Not that he wanted to suffer for the sake of suffering, but he's willing to suffer for Christ in order to know him better, to identify with him, to relate to him, becoming like him in death, through seeing sin die in his own life, even as he willingly serves Christ's purpose, even if it means his own death. In another letter, Paul explains it like this. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Resurrection power, participating in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. All of this pictures sanctification. With the new life that comes through faith in Christ also comes this progressive change in our physical and our spiritual lives. We crucify the flesh. We put to death the longings of the sin nature and we're transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Not so we can earn our salvation. Not so we can earn the, the reward of resurrection. But so that we will move ever closer to the promise that we have in Christ. The resurrection from the dead. Paul didn't have a death wish. He had a life wish. He longed for his knowledge of Christ, the intimate relationship with his Lord and Savior, to be completed and perfected in the resurrection. He wanted to know and to experience the redemption that Christ had provided in full, to have perfect knowledge of his Savior because he was no longer separated in the flesh, but instead in his presence in eternity. This is what Paul longed for. This is the hope to which he clung This was the reason for his joy. And so as we close here, I can say this, even in times like what we are living through now, it is no trouble for me to echo Paul and to say, rejoice in the Lord. He is and was And evermore will be our Lord and our Savior and our King. Our circumstances may differ. Our world may be going crazy. But each and every believer has hope. The hope that the resurrection power of Christ will bring in his name. And as we draw closer to him, as we participate in his suffering by putting to death sin and evil and actively participate in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, we will grow ever closer to him until that one day when we all will experience the complete and perfect transformation, the newness of body and life that is promised to us in the resurrection. We can always rejoice in the Lord. Because knowing God 
is always a reason for joy. So let me leave you with the words of A.W. Tozer. In his book, The Pursuit of God, he says this, God is so vastly wonderful, so utterly and completely delightful that he can, without anything other than himself, meet and overflow the deepest demands of our total nature. Rejoice in the Lord. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, this morning we praise and thank and honor and glorify you for the fact that you are joy, that knowing you in salvation is always a reason for joy. Because of who you are, because of your perfect righteousness and holiness and justice, because of your love and mercy and grace, because you are completely dependable, always reliable, always trustworthy and true. We who know you in salvation always have a reason for joy. God, help us to look to you, especially in times of difficulty, but also especially in times where things maybe aren't so difficult. Even in times of good or plenty, help us to remember that the good and plenty are from you, and they are to point us to you. They are to teach us of how good you are. God, let us be a church, let us be a people who are defined by rejoicing in you because of what your Son did for us on the cross, in whose name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Adam. Would you please stand with us? We go to the Lord and worship one more time.
Amen. Nothing but the blood. We are saved by his sacrifice on the cross. Um, let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for our time together, praising you and worshiping you. We thank you for your word, Lord, and your, re your reminder that, that our joy is found in you. But it's not found in our circumstances, Lord. And, and so we pray this week as we move forward that you would, you would train us, you would teach us, Lord, to seek our joy in you, to, to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, Lord. And and so we just want to thank you, Lord. We want to give you all the praise and all the glory that we can. In your holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. You dismiss church family. Thank you.